Oh, Father, thank you for um, crafting with your Son um, a great plan to save us. And indeed, um, you were successful. He cried out, it is finished, and it is completed. We have every reason to hope and to be secure in your sight because of his great work. Help us to set our eyes on him um, again tonight. Give us a clearer vision of our Savior who loves to save sinners. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, tonight we continue on um, in our 66 book series. We are gonna be in the Gospel of Luke. Somebody this morning asked me how I was going to do in one sermon what I did in three or four years. I said, you'll have to come and find out. I have no idea. So, before we get into the Gospel of Luke tonight, I do wanna make an appeal to you for Bible reading. Okay, first, just Bible reading. And I don't have any slides for you tonight. Um, I'll kind of give you some headings here and there. But I want to make an appeal for reading large portions of your Bible at a time. If you're not doing that already. And I want to do that by way of an illustration. Um, I learned to ride a bike, like most of you my age, on a bike that had only one gear. Right? A simple bike. Uh, to get started, to ride a very short distance, there was one gear position and one gear only. And to ride across town to baseball practice or to the swimming pool in the summer, there was only one gear to choose from. But then I got a 10 speed. And the lower gear was awesome for getting started and covering just a, a short distance. And first gear was terrible for riding all the way across town to go to baseball practice or to the swimming pool. And 10th gear was terrible for getting started, for going just a short distance, but it was awesome when cruising through the neighborhoods across town when you're late for a baseball game. There are different gears designed for different distances, right? Well, reading has different gears. Reading has different gears. When you read a dictionary, you're using a very low gear. It's like using first gear. You're not covering a lot of distance. It's just short reading. Reading an encyclopedia is similar. There are obviously other kinds of reading material where you're going to sit for a long period of time. You're going to read much greater lengths of material. There are different reading gears that are designed for different reading material. Now, In your Bible, there are small little chunks for which a very low gear of reading is is really helpful. You're, You're not covering tons of biblical ground, but you want to go over that small piece again and again and again. And I think of verses like Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. Christ lives in me. And each one of those is so deep and you just want to go over it again and again and again. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. What does that mean? He loved me and he gave himself up for me. That's first gear Bible reading. And you never want to give that up. Never. And, but, the Bible is not like a dictionary. And it's also not like an encyclopedia either. It really needs to be read with a bigger gear also. In fact, I might even say mostly it needs to be read with a bigger gear. So tonight, don't hear me say, as I make an appeal for reading large portions of Scripture, don't hear me say that I'm encouraging you to not read smaller truths and with smaller gears of reading or pieces of the Bible or principles. Don't stop doing that. But I want to appeal to you to read the Bible in alignment with how the Bible was written. It was not written like an encyclopedia where one article really doesn't have much to do with the next one or the one before it. 
The Bible is really the opposite of that. And you've seen that as we've gone through this 66 book series. And by the way, those are sermons with bigger gears because one sermon is covering one book of the Bible. Okay. Listen to how one author describes the Bible and how to use the Bible or how to read the Bible. Here's what he says. Here's how scripture differs from an encyclopedia. When I use an encyclopedia, I do not need to read other articles to understand the one I'm reading at the moment. One article has no connection to another. There are no overarching themes running through the encyclopedia. In the Bible, however, every passage is dependent on the whole. And the whole Bible is held together by interdependent themes that run through every passage like rebar, the steel rods that reinforce concrete. If I handle scripture topically, pieces only, I will miss the overarching themes at the heart of everything else that God wants to say to me. Do you believe that? So being biblical with the Bible does not mean merely quoting words from within its pages, the author goes on to say. But being truly biblical means that my counsel reflects what the entire Bible is about. The Bible is a narrative, a grand story, I would say, of the king's glory in his son. He goes on to say, we need a message big enough to overcome our natural human tendency to live for our own puny glory, to pursue our own small happiness, and to forget that our lives are much, much bigger than this little moment in life. An encyclopedia, problem-solving approach to scripture is not adequate for the true depth of our need. In other words, a small gear of reading your Bible is not enough you need the bigger gear also. So can I just give you an example of what is possible if you were to take in large portions of Bible reading? You can read through the entire Old Testament, which we just went through in this series. You can read through your entire Old Testament in three months if you read for 38 minutes a day. That's getting through the Old Testament four times in one year. Just 38 minutes. And you can read your entire New Testament in one month if you read even less than that, 35 minutes a day. That would mean 12 times in a year you'd read through the New Testament. So with less than 40 minutes of reading your Bible in the morning and maybe even less than 40 minutes of reading your Bible in the evening, you can read through the Old Testament three times, I'm sorry, four times in a year and 12 times the New Testament in a year. What if you did that for five years? The Old Testament 20 times? The New Testament 60 times? Can you imagine the rebar that you would see, those themes running throughout your Bible? Now you know and you love the effect on your heart of reading your Bible with those smaller gears. I I do, I have been crucified with Christ. What does that even mean? It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. You know the effect and the benefit of that on your heart. But have you known yet the effect on your heart of reading your Bible with those larger gears? Like reading the Gospel of Luke in one sitting, which would take you two hours and 24 minutes. Doing something like that helps you see the rebar themes of God's self-revelation more clearly. The pieces and the portions of truth and the individual principles that you love about your Bible, they won't mean less to you if you read like that with bigger gears. They won't. In fact, they'll become even more alive and more powerful in your life because you'll see how they're connected to the whole theme of the Bible. And of course, no style of Bible reading matters if your heart is bypassed. Your heart must be engaged. Now, before we drill into Luke specifically, let's emphasize now how the four gospel accounts have an inseparable 
connection back to the Old Testament. So let's talk about just the connectivity of the Old and the New Testament to each other. Obviously, your New Testament begins with four different but related gospel accounts of the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And each one of those gospel provides on page one of each one of them a crystal clear connection to your Old Testament. When we say New Testament and then there's an old one, we don't mean, well, we got the new one now, we can get rid of the old. It doesn't put that kind of space between. It's probably better to think of it as there's an older testament and God has also given us a newer one. You need to think of your testaments as tied together. Think about this. Matthew 1.1 requires an awareness of both the Pentateuch storyline and the historical section of the Old Testament because Jesus is referred to as the son of David, the son of Abraham. And you're gonna have to know the story of the Pentateuch and the historical section of who David is. Mark chapter one opens with quotes from Exodus, Isaiah, and Malachi. Luke's opening account requires an understanding of the priestly line that is established in the Pentateuch along with the temple worship regulations. And John's gospel imitates on page one the first words of Genesis one in the beginning. So as you begin the New Testament, its inseparable relationship with the Old Testament has to be kept in mind. Let's talk about the interconnectivity between the four Gospels. We are gonna get to Luke, I promise. Let's talk about how these four Gospels, we've gone through Matthew, Mark, and now we're into Luke, and Lord willing, next week, John. Let's talk briefly about how the four Gospel accounts are interconnected. By the way, to read the four Gospel accounts in one sitting would take you about eight hours. The four Gospel accounts are the historical, and theologically rich accounts of the birth, the life, the ministry, the teaching, the death and the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. And and this, of course, is the foundation for the rest of the New Testament. All that follows the four gospel accounts is dependent on and rests upon those four interdependent accounts. Coupled with the fact that those four accounts require a thorough understanding of the Old Testament, that means the four Gospels function something like a bridge from the Old Testament to the rest of the New Testament which follows it, the epistles. And together, these Gospel accounts that are connected to one another, they provide for us this picture of the eternal Son of God become man. Jesus of Nazareth is indeed the sinless servant, the substitute anticipated in the Old Testament who suffered, who bled, who died, and accomplished atonement for all who believe in him. That's who he is. That's how your Newer Testament begins. He is presented as the Savior, not only of Israel, but of the one who is gonna save the nations. And that is why these four accounts are called gospel. They're called good news. They are the good news of the life and the ministry and the teaching and the rejection and the suffering and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, the Messiah from Nazareth. These four accounts are complementary witness accounts of Jesus. No one portrait of Jesus would be enough. We have four. The first three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called synoptic gospels, meaning they share a common or similar view of Jesus. And though they are similar, that doesn't mean that they're monotonous repetitions. Oh, I read Matthew, so I don't need to read Mark. And any differences between those synoptic accounts, those first three gospels, are equally inspired, they are equally trustworthy, and they should be seen as complementary and not contradictory to the overall revelation of who Jesus Christ is. For example, for example, Matthew says that there were two men possessed in the tombs in the Gadarenes in Matthew 8, but both Mark and Luke say there was only one. So which is it? There were two, but one was the prominent focal point. We benefit from the three accounts. And in these four gospel accounts of Jesus Christ, you have everything you need for believing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You have everything you need. 
These four accounts are the very heart of the Christian faith, aren't they? All that we believe about our Savior finds its roots in these faithful accounts of his life and his death and his resurrection. And God ensured that readers from any background could find an account that stands out with particular effectiveness and interest to them. In the first century, Matthew appealed primarily to Jews. He was writing to the Jewish mind and heart, and Mark and Luke were appealing to the Gentile mind and heart, and John's account seems to almost kind of bridge both of those really well. And though you love and esteem all four of those gospels, is there not one that stands out most to you? For me, it's, it's Luke. I just love the gospel of Luke. I love the others as well, but this one stands out to me. And so now let's talk about Luke specifically. What I want you to do is I want you to be ready to go to Luke chapter one, but you also need to be ready to go to Acts chapter one. So you need to kind of position yourself ready to kind of go back and forth. It's hard to introduce Luke without also introducing Acts. Now in two weeks, Lord willing, we're gonna walk through Acts more thoroughly, but tonight in order to introduce Luke, we also have to talk about Acts a little bit. Why? Look at Luke chapter one, verses one to four. Here's what Luke says. Inasmuch as, has, as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the Lord handed them down to us, it seemed fitting for me as well, the author says, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning to write it out for you in orderly sequence, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty about the things you have been taught. Now flip over to Acts chapter 1. The first account, O Theophilus, I composed about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over 40 days and speaking about the things concerning the kingdom of God. God planned that a Gentile, Luke, we believe he's a Gentile, would write to another Gentile, we believe Theophilus is one, who happens to be an important Roman official. In chapter one, verse three, um, he is called most excellent Theophilus by Luke. That means he was a nobleman of sorts, a Roman official. So God planned that a Gentile would write to another Gentile who was an important Roman official, a two volume account of the person in the work of Jesus Christ and the advancement of his gospel in the church from Jerusalem, the capital city of the Jews, to Rome, the capital city of the Gentiles. That's what God did with these two accounts. So how, how do we think that it is that Luke is the author? Nowhere in either Luke or Acts does Luke mention himself by name as the author. I'll get you started, but it's a much more detailed process um, than what I can give you tonight, but I'll at least get you started. You know this from the opening verses of Luke and the opening verses of Acts. It is clear that they were both authored by the same person and both written to the same person, Theophilus. So when we're looking for an author, we're looking for one for the two books, not two. And from there, we notice that the author includes himself with Paul on his missionary travels at various points on his missionary journeys and acts. We call those sections the we sections, W-E, because the author is joined with him. In fact, I want you to turn to see the first one. Go to Acts chapter 16 so you can understand how this works. Acts 16, look at verse six. Second missionary journey, Paul is off with Silas and perhaps some others. And here's what the author says in Acts 16, verse six. And they, Paul and Silas, passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go to Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. And now something different happens in Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he, Paul, had seen the vision, immediately what? We 
sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to proclaim the gospel to them. This happens three other times in Acts 20, verses 5 to 15, Acts 21, 1 to 18, and it happens again in the last two chapters of Acts, Acts 27 and 28. And then you go through a larger process of elimination, and you find that Luke is the only companion of Paul who fits this profile and travel history. And you can dig into that more on your own. So even though the author of the third gospel is never identified, By name, it is widely agreed that Luke is the author. So what do we know about Luke from the rest of the New Testament? Well, he's mentioned only three times, and I'll just have you turn to one, go over to Colossians 4, and you can see what Paul says about him. Paul writes from Rome, and Luke is with him in that we section from Acts 27 to 28, and he says, Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings, and also Demas. So Luke was a physician. He is also mentioned in 2 Timothy 4.11 and Philemon 24. And as I said, it was believed that he was a Gentile, possibly from the sending church in Antioch of Syria. Perhaps he got saved there. That's the church from which Paul was sent on his missionary journeys. And what is interesting is that if he is indeed a Gentile, he is the only Gentile to write any scripture. And as such, this is even more amazing, he is the single largest contributor to the New Testament, writing Luke and Acts. Did you know that takes up almost 30% of your New Testament? And what about Theophilus? What do we know about him? Not much at all, really. He appears to be, I think, a newer believer to the faith. If he's not a believer, strangely, 30% of the New Testament is written to an unbeliever. Theophilus has been taught back in Luke chapter 1, verse 4. I'm writing these things so that you may know the certainty about the things you have been taught. That's like Matthew 28 language baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. I think he wasn't just a Gentile who heard about this, but he was actually taught it. And Luke wants him to be certain of the things that he has been taught. So Luke's desire is for him in his position of honor as a Roman authority to know for certainty the things that he has been taught. What about the bigger purpose that's going on here? For what purpose did Theophilus need an orderly arrangement of the life, the ministry, the teaching, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, as well as the church planting mission across the Roman Empire? Why does he need it in two volumes? What is going on that Luke would think this kind of a guy needs this kind of a evidence? Was it merely for Theophilus's personal and individual maturity as a believer? I'm sure it benefited him. Or was there a broader aim in mind for this man who is called most excellent, a Roman official? Think about this, Luke's wider purpose and accomplishment with these two volumes is actually that sweeping history that I've already run through a couple different times of the founding of the Christian faith in the church from the announcement of the coming of Jesus to Bethlehem in Luke 1 and 2, Bethlehem of Judea, all the way to Paul's imprisonment to, in Rome, the capital city of the Roman Empire, that's Acts 28. That's what those two accounts put together cover. And Theophilus needed to know this for certainty. And there's another sobering revelation that travels alongside this one. It's the wholesale rejection of the Jewish nation of Jesus Christ from Jerusalem to the capital city of the Gentiles, Rome. Theophilus needed a strong grasp on that as well as a Roman dignitary who has believed the gospel. Now put those things together, think about this. The gospel with its predominant and increasingly Gentile church spreading everywhere all over the Roman Empire is to be seen entirely distinct from Judaism which rejected it and persecuted it everywhere it went. A Roman official needs to know that. 
There was a Roman dignitary who needed to be certain of this. That Jesus Christ's gospel and church expanding across the Roman Empire was to be seen not as some sect of Judaism, but entirely distinct from it. Was there a need for Roman officials, Roman authorities, to see that distinction between the Christian faith, between the church and Judaism as it spread across the empire? Luke makes it very clear in Jesus' trial in Luke 23, this is interesting, the Roman governor named Pilate over and over and over says he is innocent. Jesus is innocent. I find no guilt in him. A Roman governor could see it, though the Jews attacked him. And from Jerusalem all the way to Caesarea, where Paul had been kept in prison for two years, there was no legitimate charges that ever stuck against him. He was declared to be innocent. Felix couldn't find anything. Governor Festus couldn't find anything. King Agrippa could not find anything. Roman authorities, through this Roman dignitary, Theophilus, had a two-volume documentation for not fearing the spread of Christianity. Roman governors and officials could see the innocence of Jesus and the innocence of Paul. But man, the Jews went after these people, this teaching. It was not a threat to Roman governance. And here's the big question. Was all of this tied to Paul's case before Nero? Thirty percent of the New Testament is directed in some way to Roman governing authorities providing an explanation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ, faith in him, his teachings, and the expansion of the gospel in the church. Listen, at a minimum, if you walk away with anything tonight, you know that Luke and Acts is a message to ruling authorities of the world. When did Luke research and write his gospel? When did this happen? It is thought that Luke did his research in interviews with eyewitnesses during Paul's two-year imprisonment in Caesarea in Acts 21 through 26. That was about AD 56 through 58. That time would have allowed him to investigate everything carefully from the beginning, Luke 1, 3. He could have traveled and spoken to eyewitnesses who were still alive, like how did he know that Jesus took a trip to Jerusalem when he was 12? He probably talked to Mary. And Luke, because he traveled extensively with Paul on his missionary journeys, remember the we sections where he said he was with them? He obviously therefore had access to Paul and Paul's own records and Paul's own memory of his missionary endeavors so that he could write Acts. And then once Luke and Paul both survived the shipwreck, Acts 27, and they finally get to Rome. Paul is in prison two more years there, and Luke could have put into final written form this two-volume account of everything he had researched for Theophilus. And Luke and Acts were most likely therefore written, I believe, about AD 60 to 61. What about Luke's structure as a gospel? Luke's broad and basic structure, it, I think, breaks down into kind of like one half and the other half. Go to Luke chapter 9, verse 51. Let me show you the dividing point. Luke chapter 9, verse 51. This is a good dividing point in Luke's gospel. Now it happened, 951, when the days for him to be taken up were soon to be fulfilled. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now, when he says to be taken up, that's not raised from the dead. That's ascended. That's his ascension. And so Jesus knows the days for his victory are coming close. And he has to get to Jerusalem. 
So as you move from 951 forward, no scene should be thought of without the backdrop of Jesus' resurrection and ascension, his victory. Every scene needs to be thought of in light of that ultimate kingly advantage that Jesus attained in Jerusalem when he ascended. Jesus went to Jerusalem to suffer. That is true. And Jesus went to Jerusalem to be rejected. Yes. Jesus went to Jerusalem to die. Yes. Jesus went to Jerusalem to be resurrected. True. But Luke put the emphasis on his ascension from Jerusalem into heaven. And we should not look at anything that flows and follows after that without that in mind. Who can stop what Jesus Christ will enact from the right hand of the Father? He was able to look beyond the cross with joy to what was afterwards because he knew he was going to be victorious. Now, let me finish um, by giving you some themes in Luke. I'm just going to give you two of them. Um, They're probably the two most important in my mind, and the first one stands above and beyond all others. Here's the best theme in Luke. It is that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. That's the theme of Luke. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. I want to show you this. Look at Luke chapter 5, verse 29. Luke 5, verse 29. Matthew, also known as Levi, was a tax collector. And upon following Jesus in Luke 5, verse 29, it says that Levi, Matthew, gave a big reception for him in his house. And there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with him. And the Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, it is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Listen, the sinners in in, um, Israel had been abandoned by Judaism, by the religious leadership, but not by Jesus. They were avoided and they were shunned by Judaism, but Jesus pursued them. Look at the best chapter on this. Go to Luke chapter 15. You'll find a very similar setting. You're gonna see this theme running throughout all of Luke. Look how chapter 15 starts. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. That sounds just like Luke 5. And both the Pharisees and the scribes were doing the same thing they were doing in chapter 5. They were grumbling, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And so that prompted Jesus to tell these three parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. Let's just look at the first one. What man among you, verse 4, if he has 100 sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you that in the same way, There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Look at verse 10, after the lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Look at verse 32, after the lost son is found. The father says, but we had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and is alive. He was lost and he has been found. Listen, the whole entire chapter is devoted to that theme illustrated with three stunning pictures of that which was lost being found, a lost sheep, a lost coin, a lost son. And again, Jesus stands in stark contrast to the religious leadership of Israel. And not just that Jesus saves despicable outcasts and then tolerates them. I'll I'll save you, but just don't get close to me. But he loves to save them, and there's joy in doing so in heaven. Go to Luke chapter 19. See if this sounds familiar. Jesus is getting very close to entering Jerusalem. He's in 
Jericho, verse 1, 19, 1. And Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was. You know the story. He was small in stature. He ran ahead, verse 4, climbed up into a tree, verse 5. Jesus came to that place. He looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and he came down and he received him gladly. Now watch this, verse 7. And when they saw it, this is the crowd. It's not just the religious leadership now. It's the whole crowd. When they saw it, they did what the religious leadership did. They grumbled saying, he has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And you know what Jesus says in verse nine and 10, today salvation has come to this house because Zacchaeus too is a son of Abraham for the son of man has come to seek and to save the lost. He loves to save sinners. One last one, go to Luke 23 verse 39. Luke 23, verse 39. This is stunning. This is his most excruciating moment on earth, bearing the wrath of sinners away from his Holy Father, suffering for sin that is not his own. Verse 39, and one of the criminals hanging there was blaspheming Jesus, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other thief answered, rebuking him and said, do you not even fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, what clarity in the midst of suffering. And we indeed are suffering justly for we are receiving what we deserve for what we have done. But this man has done nothing wrong. Another declaration of the innocence of Jesus. And he was saying to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. So in his most excruciating moment, as he's bearing the wrath of God away from this thief on the cross. He is functioning as a savior in his mind. He can never lose that savior mentality of, I'm going to save you. You will be safe with me even today in paradise. Listen to me, this is your hope. This is your hope. There is no place of rebellion that you can ever go to There's no place of lostness that you've ever been that is beyond the saving reach of Jesus Christ. If you have ruined your life with sin and you have found even others around you repulsed at what you've become because you have so ruined yourself with sin, know this, that Jesus Christ loves to save sinners like you. And he does, and he did. We're all testimony of that. Anybody who is a believer. Those whom he calls to himself, those who come to him in humble faith and repentance, he will never refuse them. In fact, all of heaven will rejoice if you come to Christ. When you come to Christ. Believer, listen. Guard your heart. Guard your heart to keep it near the Savior's heart for sinners. Don't ever let your heart drift toward the attitude of the religious elite of Israel who shunned sinners and who were bugged by them. And know that this message of hope for sinners, it comes oftentimes with great criticism against it. Every time we saw one of those passages from the thief on the cross all the way back to Luke 5, with tax collectors and sinners, there was always a criticism against Jesus. Great criticism, yes. But great hope for sinners like you and me. That's the best theme in the Gospel of Luke. There's another theme that I want you to think about as we finish, and this is the theme of prayer. Here was the second member of the Godhead, the Son of God, already in perfect relationship and union with God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, enjoying communion with God in prayer. 
If there was ever someone who might seem to not need to pray, it would be this man, would it not? And yet repeatedly, over and over, Jesus communes with his Father. He pursues his Father in prayer. He talks to his Father in prayer. He requests of his Father in prayer. He bears his perfect soul's burdens to his Father. He just loved to be with his Father in prayer. And that is such a rebuke to my own heart. First of all, let's, let's work hard against thinking of prayer merely as something that's transactional. You know, I have a need, I go to the supply house, I ask, I receive, I move on. Now there are elements of that in prayer, obviously. But prayer for Jesus was never merely that. Prayer for Jesus was much more than a transactional thing. It was a relational thing. So I want to just encourage you, along with my own heart, to pursue prayer firstly because we want to simply express our relationship and our enjoyment of our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Now there are about 10 passages in Luke. We'll just work through as many as we can until we finish at the top of the hour here. But let's go to Luke chapter five. I want you to be encouraged by this. I hope this will fortify your prayer life. It has mine as I've thought about this and been dwelling on this and prepping for this, reminding myself of this. Luke five, verse 15. But the news about Jesus was spreading even farther and large crowds were gathering to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But he himself would often slip away to the desolate regions and he would pray. Look at it, look at this. The, the crowds are coming upon him. They have all kinds of desperate needs. Sick people, dying people, paralyzed people, lepers, demon possessed. He, they all came to him, crowding on him. And in the busyness of life and the busyness of ministry, intimacy and relationship with the Father, dependency on the Father was a non-negotiable for him. The busyness of ministry actually required time away from it so that he could fellowship with his father, so he could be in dependence on his father. Prayer can sometimes be seen so wrongly um, as, as ineffective to getting things done. There's just all this busyness of ministry over here that, that my, my to-do list is just big and it, there's so much to do in life and in parenting and just getting ready for the next thing and, and to draw away into a desolate place and to, to just talk with God? Yeah, that's exactly the point. There's such a tendency in my own heart to rush past the prayerful fellowship that I desperately need with the Father so I can just get to work, so that I can solve problems, so that I can build up a ministry, so I can do whatever it is that's in front of me. And Jesus didn't see ministry that way at all, and he didn't see prayer that way at all. He put pauses in his ministry and in his work, his busyness, in order to seek the Father and to express his need of him. Luke 9, verse 10 is probably a similar setting. Go over to Luke chapter 6, verse 12. Look at this. Luke 6, 12 and 13. Now it happened that at this time he went off to the mountain to pray, and he was spending the whole night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he also named as apostles. So before he chose his disciples, Jesus would not bypass communing with the Father about them. They were an opportunity for him to just express his relationship with his Father, independence and alignment with his Father. He prayed not because he had doubts about his choices or he didn't know who to pick, but he couldn't think of big decisions like this one, men who are going to stay close to him for the next three years. He couldn't think of big decisions apart from fellowship with the Father and alignment with his will. 
And that just makes me think in every important decision in front of us, we get to express, if we're wise, our desire for just fellowship with him in that decision. Dependency on the Father in that decision. Look in the same chapter down at verse 27. 627, Jesus says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who disparage you. You got enemies, people who hate you, curse you, and disparage you. We're asked to do nothing less than what Jesus regularly did in his own prayers to the Father for the lost. You're going to see this as we finish with Jesus praying on the cross. If there's anyone with, with whom you might have friction because of the gospel, I just encourage you to not give up praying for them. Just pray for them. Go to Luke chapter nine, verse 18. Chapter nine, verse 18. This is fascinating. And it happened that while he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. So they're gathered around nearby somehow, but he is the only one who's praying. And from that, he questioned them saying, who do the crowds say that I am? And they give their answer. And then he said, but who do you say that I am? And then he drops the biggest bomb on them. Verse 22, I'm gonna suffer. I'm gonna be rejected, I'm gonna be killed, and I'm gonna be raised. Prayer, Jesus is praying, and it positioned him to effectively penetrate into the mindset of his disciples. He comes out of prayer and he asks them questions. Who do the crowds say I am? And they give an answer, and then he says, who do you say I am? Because he's listening for can they, have they yet been able to pull themselves apart from the crowd and their perception of Jesus? He wants to know. He's been praying, and this is what he wants to ask them. Because if they have pulled themselves apart, which it looks like they have, he's ready to tell them the biggest truth that's going to be upsetting to them. But all of this comes out of prayer. What benefit can you and I bring into our ministry to one another when we commune first with God? And what insight might you have if you've been praying and then you come to me? What insight into my life might you have into my mindset? And vice versa. What great opportunities we have. Look at verse 28, same chapter. It happened some eight days after these words that they would see the kingdom of God. Some of them wouldn't die until they saw it that taking along Peter and James and John, he went up on the mountain to pray. And this is great. It happened that while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different and his clothing became white and gleaming. And behold, two men were talking with him and they were Moses and Elijah. He just prayed and, and he's changed and dead people are showing up. And who appearing in glory, they were speaking of his departure, which he was about to fulfill at Jerusalem. You see, he was going to be taken up. When Jesus prayed, the kingdom of God could be tangibly experienced on a mountaintop. Just think about that. Jesus prays, and on earth somewhere, on a mountaintop, the kingdom of God can be seen. He prays and dead Old Testament saints show up. That communion and that dependence on the Father was powerful. There's nobody like him. And he prays for you and me from the right hand of the Father, Hebrews 7, 25. What is possible because he prays for us? What is too big for his prayers in your life? Listen, don't put confidence in your prayers. Put confidence when he prays, in his prayers. Put confidence in him. Go to Luke chapter 11. Verse 1. 
It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, all right, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves are for, also forgive everyone who's indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Jesus' communion with the Father in prayer was appealing to his disciples. They wanted to know how to do it. They knew that that had happened with John and his disciples. And so here is the pattern given. And it's just remarkably simple, isn't it? Isn't it great? It's just so simple. In fact, this is even shorter than Matthew's account. Start off and talk to God about God. God, here's your, here's your reputation. Here's your name. Here's what you, you're, you're hallowed. You are holy. You are set apart. You are unlike anybody else. Talk to God about his agenda. It would be really great if you just reigned here now. That's what we want. Talk to him about your daily needs. God, I'm really content if all I know is I have my bread for today. I, I don't need you to fill my fridge. I don't need you to fill my cupboards. I don't need you to fill the pantry. I don't need you to make sure that I have enough on my card so that I can go through any drive through I want. Just today, you are so trustworthy that all I need is just today because I know you've got me covered. Talk to him about your need for forgiveness. I've sinned against you, God. Forgive me, please. And like you enjoy the mercy from God in your forgiveness, be merciful to those, those who sin against you. And because you are surrounded by temptation in this world, talk to him about how you desire him to not lead you into any temptation. It's everywhere. Let's look at one last one and we'll close with this. Luke 23, he's on the cross. Luke 23, verse 34. The last time we see him praying in Luke. It's the most amazing prayer. Look at verse 33. And when they, had, uh, they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him, Jesus, and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. It's the most amazing prayer. As he is suffering under the wrath of God, as he is feeling that horrific eternal separation from his Father because of our sin upon him, not, not because of his own, he still cries out to his Father in prayer. On behalf of the sinners that are in front of him, He's looking out on these people in front of him. In a matter of about 50 days, there are going to be thousands of them who believe at Pentecost. 2,000 in one day, 3,000 another time. Pretty soon, Luke can't even count it anymore. He's praying on the cross for them. And they have no idea what they're doing. They have no idea the extent of their rebellion against God. He says, they don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. He does not say to you, he doesn't say to me, when you figure out how awful you've been, I'll pray for you. He knows we have no grasp on the depth and the hideousness of our rebellion and our transgression and the twisted perversion of our sin against him. He knows that and he prays anyway. He prays anyway. We have no idea what we're really committing against a sinless substitute who died. And Jesus didn't wait for the crowd to grasp the depths to pray for their forgiveness. And he doesn't wait for you to get wise first and then pray. Listen, you, you need to spend the rest of your life studying what the Bible says about how hideous your sin is. You need to do that. Don't stop doing that. But that is not the condition by which he then prays for you. Otherwise, he would never pray. What a savior, a savior who loves to pray to his father. Let's pray together and close our time. 
Oh, Heavenly Father, Luke tells us about your son, that he loves fellowship in alignment under you. He loves to sneak away from the busyness and the people surrounding him and have a prayerful relationship with you, Father. And Luke tells us that your son loves to save sinners. And we just see here that, Lord Jesus, you pray for the forgiveness of the sinners that you love to save over whom you rejoice. Heavenly Father, thank you for Luke's hard work of having investigated everything carefully. Boy, do we benefit, Lord, from his hard work. And thank you for this Theophilus, whoever he was, and how he was the first immediate recipient of this two-volume account. We get to look over his shoulder, so to speak, and benefit from what was written to him. Thank you for preserving it for us. Heavenly Father, we, we need you, and we love you, and we love your son, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.